Uh, welcome to COVID-19 uh, fireside chat this evening in conversation with Indigenous health professionals uh, from Canada, the United States and Australia. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, tonight and days previous, COVID-19 has been on our minds and so as a group of health professionals, our goal tonight is to share information geared towards Indigenous communities. Um, this is something that is lacking and this information is from Indigenous physicians and health professionals who are uh, working on the ground around mobilizing. One of the realities right now is that we have information coming from everywhere and no doubt it's been on your news feed, whatever news feed you're uh, part of. Um, this information tonight isn't meant to override it, it really is a conversation with people who um, you know, do have medical training, but are also grounded in their cultures and traditions and are connected to community. Um, so some of the uh, information we'll be sharing tonight is around personal experiences of self-isolation, symptom review and discussions with your children, uh, real conversations uh, about leading pandemics while in isolation or leading pandemics in our communities. Um, and uh, we'll be answering questions from you as well. So my name is Elisa Levi, and I'm one of your moderators tonight, and uh, James Makokas as well. So I'll pass it on to James. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us on Saturday evening or afternoon, wherever you are, or morning if you're in Australia, as one of our panelists is from. Tansi James Makokas, Nitsiga Asun, Egoa Uchinia Unikskapuni, Kiho Kapapemote, Egoa Mistigua Sikna Pesis Nui Huin. Um, it's a pleasure to be here co-hosting with um, one of our colleagues and medical students, Elisa Levi from the Mi'kmaq and Anishinaabe Nations. And um, we put together a diverse group of panelists from across Turtle Island, from Hawaii, from Australia, and um, as well as our own country here in Canada. And we're so excited to be able to hear about them and what they have to offer tonight. Just as a background to this, um, Anthony and I were traveling to the United States at the beginning of March, and um, Dr. Alita Fijo was actually the one who called us as we were on the way to the airport to ask us, what are you doing for your people in you know, where you're from? And it really got me thinking as to how we're preparing our people, our nations, and our communities about this crisis. And so um, this is part of that response is, providing some good information for people that's easy to digest um, from people that look like us. Um, there's, a, a, there's a lacking of that in the media right now. So um, we'd love to go around the table and have everybody introduce themselves, where you're from, where you're working, um, and, and then we'll get started. Thank you. Let's start with Dr. Potts. Hi, good evening. Okay. From, I'm, call, I'm connecting with you from Mokinstis in Blackfoot Territory in Southern Alberta. It's really a pleasure to be here this evening with everyone and connect with, with everyone on this panel and all of you out there. Thank you for you know, tuning in. I called out to my family and said, I know you're home, so I hope those of you that are on. So, okay, Nadaniko Sakwit Beam. Um, my name is uh, Last to Come In. I'm from the Bikani Nation and I'm a family physician who works um, in a variety of areas. I primarily work um, in primary care with only Indigenous people. I work out in the Siksika Nation. I'm the medical director at Elbow River Healing Lodge and I work with the Nititipi School. And my disclosure just on that is when I speak tonight, I speak from my experience and what I'm going through personally as a family doctor um, and I do not represent those entities that I speak for. I just want to be clear on that. So um, just to, for, for their protection and mine. And um, I have had about 10 years experience in the community. I've worked as a nurse. Um, I'm a mother and have had a lot of unfortunate experience with COVID-19, which I'll discuss in a bit. So yeah, thanks for having me today. Thank you so much, Dr. Potts. Um, next, we'll go to Australia down under, um, Dr. Alita Fijo. Hello, um, I'm Dr. Alita Fijo. I'm uh, an Aboriginal traditional owner and elder of the Larrakia tribe on my father's side. Uh, from my mother, I'm Warramunga, which is more in the central part of Australia. Uh, my skin name is Nabuljari. Uh, I've been working for the last four and a half years as a locum um, phys uh, physician, um, 
across the top part of Australia where it's warm and uh, currently for the last three weeks I've been working for the Northern Territory Government. In the last two weeks I've been working in the prison system and found that we've got a lot of people there without a voice. Um, my brother is the chairperson of the Larrakia Nation, so that's uh, for our tribe, and I've been uh, uh, working very closely with him, especially over the COVID virus, because we have a lot of very vulnerable people here that we have to protect because we love them. Thanks so much, Dr. Bijo. Bijo. Um, next, we have Dr. Kavika Liu, um, an Indigenous Hawaiian physician, um, and we'll have him introduce himself. Aloha o Kavika Liu ko in no no Hawaii mai val um, ekano mai ka ali val in no ho i Hawaii ki em no va no ho val i kamoko puni honui. Um, so my name is Kavika Liu. I'm an uh, internal medicine, pediatrics, and addiction medicine. Um, uh, and I excuse myself because unfortunately I cannot speak directly to what's happening in Hawaii right now because I live in, um, on Turtle Island. Um, but I will speak from general perspectives as a, a, both an internist and a pediatrician. Um, my um, practice is actually administrative, um, working at uh, two hospitals uh, here in uh, one in Riverside and one in San Bernardino County, California. But um, I have some direct experiences as far as our um, care for um, the general hospital OSPR operations, as well as having participated in some testing, some county level testing um, for people um, who uh, were either healthcare workers or, or actually there were some even some drive ups. So um, I'd be glad to speak from that perspective. Mahalo. Thank you so much, Dr. Liu. Um, next, we have from the eastern part of Canada, Dr. Karen Hill. Um, Dr. Hill, can you introduce yourself to everybody, please? Thank you. Hi, Sego Sego Guego, Galano Ue Niyangats, Gani Gehaga Niwakwanjora, Oswega Niwageno. My English name is Karen Hill, and I am a family doctor. Um, for the last seven years, I've been working at Six Nations of the Grand River Territory, um, which is my home community, um, working in collaboration, uh, primary care, because I'm a family doctor, with um, our, some of our traditional medicine practitioners. Um, more recently, I've transitioned from that practice, and I'm starting to do more uh, seems like community mobilization around picking up the traditional knowledge again, uh, embodying that traditional knowledge, and also doing some clinical locums uh, in Northern Ontario out of um, Moose Factory uh, in the James Bay area. That's it. Thanks so much, Dr. Hill. Um, you've been an inspiration to me also as we work to do that in Kiki Cree Nation and to integrate our own Nehio Mastikia alongside Western medicine. So thank you for all the work that you and the traditional medicine people in Six Nations do. Um, and lastly, we have Dr. Bernice Downey uh, joining us, who is a medical anthropologist, who's also Cree um, and uh, a registered nurse with uh, many years of experience. I had the pleasure of going to Ecuador uh, for a PAHO gathering as a medical student with Dr. Downey. So, Dr. Downey, please introduce yourself to everybody. But please unmute your mic. <laughs> Bernice Downey, Nigani Kwe, Dijit Nagaz. My name is Bernice Downey. I've also been given the name of Niganakwe, which means head woman. I'm actually Anishinaabe, Ojibwe Soto. My family is from uh, Lake St. Martin and um, Dauphin River, Manitoba. Uh, for the most part, I've grown up here in Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe territory in Hamilton, Ontario. I'm currently situated uh, at the McMaster University Faculty of Health Science as the Indigenous Health Lead. I was a nurse for many years. I'm currently a medical anthropologist. And um, I also hold a chair, Heart and Stroke uh, Foundation and CIHR chair, um, looking at um, Indigenous women's um, heart health and uh, um, uh, health literacy. So my research interests are in the area of harmonizing uh, Western medical systems and uh, Indigenous traditional healing. 
I'm very happy to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you so much, Dr. Downey. So we'd like to start out the conversation tonight just with um, a where are we in terms of, you know, everybody being on the same page. What is COVID? Um, what are some of the statistics around this? So we'd like to ask Dr. Liu, uh, who has a background in internal medicine, to be able to provide this for everybody. Dr. Liu, are you still there? Okay, there you Hi, are. So coronavirus is, is actually a member of the coronavirus family, um, which is a very wide family. In fact, the common cold, many of those um, illnesses are actually a coronavirus infection, but obviously have a, a different severity um, uh, than, the, than that of the, the novel coronavirus. Um, the novel coronavirus is related to the same viruses that cause the, um, the MERS and the SARS outbreaks. Um, but really what we're finding with the, the difference is that um, the spread of this virus, um, that um, one of the things people are con con really concerned about, and we were discussing this before, is that it seems like depending upon when testing started, it seems like the cases are just getting more and more and more and more every day. But as we discussed, it really depends upon when you first start testing, how much cases you will find. For example, in China, they've, they've hit the point where they're starting to have no new cases or only a few new cases every day because they've been testing for over a month. Whereas, when did you folks start testing in Canada? I'm not sure. But um, anyway, if you start today, say, for example, you start testing today, you'll find so many, many, many more cases of, that, um, of the coronaviruses, and it'll look like it's, it's taking off by wildfire. But in fact, these cases might have been existing, but just had not been tested for. I think the other thing to realize is that most people who are infected with the coronavirus have either um, asymptomatic or mild illness. That is something more similar to the common cold or a flu. It's really the people that we are most worried about in our communities are the elders and the, the people with a, a compromised immune systems um, rather than uh, someone who is a healthy and, um, and, and a younger person. That's not to say, though, at the same time that we shouldn't be concerned because there are definitely a cohort of younger people who are getting ill. And, and the illnesses can range all, you know, from something similar to a pneumonia that people might um, order if it was bacterial treat with antibiotics to potentially life-threatening illnesses. And of course, it's the, the life-threatening illnesses and, and the, the potential for spread of this virus that are really um, of, of most concern. And I think that, you know, as far as we're going to talk more about the community, but just basically um, that... There's a recent, actually just a few days ago, article from the New England Journal of Medicine that, that's found that the virus can survive on surfaces as long as three days. And that's either plastic or, or steel, different from other ones. And that, but most cleaning methods, actually I heard a, a public health professional say, soap is king. That is, you don't even need the fancy um, uh, anti, uh, antibacterial that actually won't work. Even if you don't have the alcohol-based hand sanitizer, wash your hands. And there's wash hands and clean surfaces. I mean, really, when we're talking about trying to prevent the spread of this, it's washing our hands and cleaning surfaces and using ordinary um, household products. Mahalo. Thanks so much for that. Um, and we'll continue to um, share information as each of the speakers go through a series of questions that are both uh, pers personal and offer perspective. So for the first question tonight, I wanted to start off by asking Dr. Potts, um, knowing uh, that most recently you uh, returned from a family vacation and had to uh, self-isolate um, you know, after showing symptoms. Uh, many people are worried about this and many people are doing this as they're returning back to our communities from vacations or from uh, travel. Can you tell us about how you dealt with this as a physician um, in your community? 
Hi, thank you. So yeah, we went to Disneyland and as I was coming out of Pirates Care of the Caribbean and I told my children, you know, this was a good vacation and we're going home. We flew home through LAX. And one of the interesting things is we knew this was a world pandemic occurring. There was no screening going on through LAX or even through the Calgary airport. There was a small sign. If you have a fever, let the border agent know. And so we came home and being self-aware and doing our cleaning and hand washing and just you know, making sure you can fend off a four-year-old from licking all the ropes. We did our best really to try, um, you know, be well. Well, about three days later, my daughter started with a cough and a fever and she said, mom, I don't feel good. And I told my husband, oh no. I said, we were traveling through LAX. We're not sure what we're going to do. And he said, I think we're going to be okay. Well, two, about 12 hours after that, I developed a sore throat and a fever and extreme fatigue. And all as a physician and as a person who's in community, I'm thinking I have like 51 things I have to do. I can't be sick. That's often what went through my mind. And I called HealthLink as um, just at that point, Alberta was starting as a process of screening and recognizing um, as they're declaring pandemics and the declaring emergencies throughout the world, we were kind of getting on board around those first weeks of March. So I phone our local number and I'm told, you have the symptoms, you now cannot leave your home. Just like that. Just like that, I couldn't leave to get groceries. I couldn't leave to go even get basic things like milk and cream. I wasn't prepared for it. I was not um, anticipating that. I live in the city. My family lives, unfortunately, far away. And I wondered, what am I going to do? And I got very scared. And I got scared because all we've seen in Italy is people dying. We see people in China dying. We see people getting very sick. And knowing the statistics that you get cold-like symptoms and most people get better, it was still a very scary place because my home became this place that was not a solitude. It became a forced, forced entity for me that I didn't want to be at first. And yet I called on my uncle, my uncle Jerry, and I said to him, you know, I'm scared and can you pray? And we have our ways with our pipes and our ceremonies. And he said, Lana, now it's just time to be still. Now it's just time to reflect and just take ownership of where you are. And it's going to be okay. And I think it was that and reaching out through our, our ways and through our medicine that it helped ground me. And so for the next, what has gone on now to be almost three weeks, I have not been able to return to work because it's not safe. I still have symptoms. I was still coughing. I had a runny nose. And despite me thinking, well, I'm well, I had to think about the elders and I had to think about the children and people who I work with with chronic illness that I don't want to get them sick. And my children were very scared. And my daughter one day broke down and she said to me, mom, are we going to die? Are we going to die in our house? Is that what that means? Because that's what she was getting from the news. And I'll speak to it a little later around kids, but I really had to talk with her around what's important, what this means around connecting and cleaning and, you know, just finding ways to be kind of to be with each other. And it's really opened up a way of bringing back the family dinner and bringing back family ways to connect. But to have that experience that one day you just cannot leave your home. And then what do you do made me think about all the people in community, all the people who may not have the resources of skip the dishes or grocery delivery or somebody be able to drop things off. I had to start to contemplate this. What does this look like really for my family, my community and my friends? And I've come up with some strategies that I've shared with my own work experience, but I want people to know that it's, it is real and it's something we have to take seriously. And despite I wrote even Facebook messages about this that, you know, despite me having to get to work and having a job that required me on the front line, I had to be responsible and I had to think about you and I want you to think about other people as well, that if you're unwell, you, you continue to self-isolate and get good information. Thank you so much for sharing that, Dr. Potts, because I know it hit home like very quickly um, about, um, you know, how we can all become affected by that, especially as frontline health workers and how scary it is, especially for our children. So, um, Dr. Liu, you also have some children and, you know, as an internist, as a pediatrician, what are some ways that you recommend parents to talk to their children uh, about this as well? And those of you, you know, who are also on the panel who have children, um, maybe afterwards you can discuss how you've done that with your family and your kids. 
I think that, you know, really the message for both my um, Kiki, my daughters, and, um, and, and in general, is just not to panic, is to realize that, that this is an illness that, you know, at this point looks very scary, but um, that we will get through it. And it may be, you know, there's, there's some evidence that heat, some evidence of humidity, we will get through this. This is not something that we're going to be in. You know, we are in, um, in, in lockdown here, but, you know, use it as a way of bringing, as, as Dr. Potts said, of bringing our families together. That, you know, we will be spending a lot of time together and, you know, we can love and support, um, support that. Um, but that, yeah, there's things that we need to concentrate on. And one is that, you know, if, uh, sorry, you know, we're not going to be doing friend visits, but you can, you can call them, you can FaceTime them, please, you know, be in contact with your friends and, and, and maintain those connections. Um, the other thing is, you know, again, wash your hands, <laughs> wash your hands. There's can't be too much washing hands. And also, um, if it's age appropriate to get them involved in cleaning and to realize that, you know, how we're going to try and stay well is to wash our hands and clean. And that's wiping frequently touched surfaces. So, um, you know, basically the, the way I've talked to them is you know, just basically not to panic, trying to get them activities because, you know, they're, they're not used to being homeschooled. Um, they're, not, um, they're not used to, you know, not having all the activities that they have and just try and find fun things that they can do while keeping that social distance. Thank you so much, Dr. Liu. Um, other parents on the panel, how have you um, talked to your children or uh, loved ones about this? I don't have um, little children anymore. Um, my children are grown. Um, but as you're talking, I'm remembering from when I was younger and how um, my mother and my grandmother, when we were sick, when I had the chicken pox, for example, which is very contagious. Um, one person was assigned to take care of me. Um, so that person brought me all my food and we didn't have places to isolate and be gone in your room by yourself. But I sort of, you know, my grandmother said, you sit there, that's where you sit, that's your chair, we'll serve you. They used the same plate, the same cup, the same silverware, it was washed only by the one person that was taking care of me. Um, you know, I, I was always washing my hands. That person would always wash their hands. That took care of me. Um, the other thing is, when we were children, we were never allowed to watch the news. Um, in Lodinoshoni culture, the children are everything. And to us, that means we protect their mind. And one of the ways we protect their mind is we don't let them watch the news. We don't let them hear things that are really for adults. And in my family, we were not allowed. I, I didn't watch the news until I was probably about 19 years old um, because that was, just some, that was just the way that we were raised. And I think that's a traditional concept that can come back, especially in this day of Facebook and so many different sources. We're confused as adults. I cannot imagine what it's like for children. So down sending our children, picking back up that traditional way of protecting our children's minds and their spirits is very important at a time like this to get back to that place again. My brother um, monitors, he raises his grandchildren and he monitors their, their um, messenger accounts. Like they, they can't just go anywhere they choose. It's very controlled, it's very monitored. Um, and those are some of the things that we can do for our kids just to keep them safe because they get so anxious. You know, I'm anxious. <laughs> at times, but you know, so that's just one of the things that I was thinking of. Uh, Dr. Hill, you raise an interesting point. There is such a huge amount of information right now and there are videos that circulate in, in our communities. Uh, you know, we use uh, Facebook and we use those uh, videos to share and uh, one that comes to mind is someone reached out to me today to say, you know, is it on hair? How do we, you know, how do I, what if I touch my dog? Do I get it from my dog? So. Um, what recommendations or if anybody could speak to, um, you know, where can we get information that is true, is current, and uh, that we can trust? Hi, so this is Lana. Um, so part of my role is working with different governments and different um, 
um, organizations within the province. And I think within each province, one of the things is to get up to date information um, around for adults. And I agree with Karen. I think we, we sometimes involve kids in adult things and we need to separate that and start just to do adult things. And through different websites, such as alberta.ca within Alberta, um, has up to date information that's within plain language. They've um, even translated some of the uh, documents into Blackfoot and Cree. Um, so there are some Indigenous um, documents that are out there. I think locally just checking with your government websites within each province's first um, is important. And to answer the question about the hair. So yes, this is a, what they call droplet, meaning that when you cough or you spit or it comes out with um, when you're talking, um, that it can stay. So if somebody's coughing around you and you're around and it lands in your hair or it lands on your skin, it needs to be washed off. Healthcare recommends, um, you know, washing your hair if you're in a high risk area for your personal hair. Can you get this from the dog? That's still, that's still debates out there depending on where the information is. But there's good information shared through government that's vetted through the CDC, the World Health Organization to go first. Um, I always say don't listen to the Facebook meme because often that's not always correct. Thank you so much. I just wanted to make, oh, yeah, I just wanted to make a uh, comment um, as a grandparent. Um, so, I have two small grandchildren, uh, age seven and five. They are the light of my life. They live about an hour and 40 minutes away. And um, they just moved this past July, so I'm slowly getting used to them not being, you know, around the corner uh, here in the city. Um, and I'm very grateful for the technology, um, you know, to be able to see their little faces. We've done storybook reading at bedtime. Um, I'm learning how to play Roblox so that I can interact with them at their level. Um, I know that technology is not available for everybody and it can be a really hard time if you're separated from family. I also have uh, an elderly mother in long-term care. Um, and here in Ontario, all visitation is uh, on hold. Um, and so it's, it's really troubling to know that she's uh, in long-term care on her own. Uh, but I was sharing with others yesterday that uh, where there's a will, there's a way. And I arranged with one of the staff to uh, drive up to just underneath her window. They brought her to the window and just like the dude with the sign, I held up a piece of cardboard that said, hi, mom. And uh, so, you know, it's, it's challenging, but uh, we're resilient and we're creative and we have to, um, you know, try to work things out with our families the best we can. Um, it's, it is very challenging, though, as a grandparent, and uh, so I just wanted to share that. Can I just say also that um, I'm growing up with uh, with small, uh, sorry, with chicken pox, um, that, that epidemic, um, my parents put us, all of our children in together in the one room in the same bed so that we could all get that uh, sickness together and that sh she would get it, you know, sorted over and done with. This is not a good idea, not for this one, okay? Just wanted to say that. Keep, keep, try and keep everybody separate, isolate, because if you as a parent will get it, um, you know, we, we, we need to be able to look after everybody. Thanks for bringing it up, that, that up. That um, leads me to the next question we have, and a question that's been on uh, the chat um, side of the conversation right now, uh, sending all of you guys hearts, um, is the realities that many of our households face. I know when I was younger, there were 18 people in my household. Um, that was cousins, family members, etc. And so um, I was wondering if you could comment on some of the unique challenges that arise when we're trying to bring these messages that we keep hearing about washing your hands, about, you know, isolation, um, about, uh, you know, those, those messages that we're hearing when we face realities such as overcrowded houses. Um, and maybe if, um, if somebody else could speak to, you know, how leadership in your communities are dealing with this and supporting community members, uh, families, and, and such in these times. Um, I'll start this conversation. Um, so at Six Nations, we were very proactive, sort of after the SARS um, epidemic, 
um, we developed um, a community crisis strategy, an emergency strategy, which at this point in time, our new chief, Mark Hill, uh, declared a state of emergency on March 15th. And they mobilized that whole system that was set up. Uh, it includes public health, which is federally run. It includes the Six Nations Health Services, which is the community run component. Um, so they've been able to mobilize um, some of that. We, we do have people in our community that live um, without running water and they live that way by choice um, most often um, as a, in a traditional way. Um, but, and I'm not sure exactly how they've been reached out to those people um, in terms of, you know, because they don't have running water per se, um, they do have water, but it's just not, you know, the way we would um, coming out of tap sort of thing. Um, but I guess thinking about the overcrowding as well, um, I guess I just think that now is a time for us to really look at our health services and, you know, if things are being shut down. Um, you know, some of these clinics um, that aren't working could become a place to give people respite that are in crowded situations, right? That we can mobilize these community spaces that, you know, uh, are used for other things um, to support that. And I'm thinking especially in these northern communities where, you know, the neighbors got 18 people and you've got 19, it's kind of hard to um, get the support from a neighbor, but some of these federal health centers have like apartments in them where the health providers stay. Um, they have clinic rooms, they have places that they could support some of these people. It's looking at what we have in a different way uh, to support what we know is going to be good health practice um, to keep people well, uh, to keep people who are sick isolated from other people. That's just what's coming to my mind you know one of the things that um that we I'm, i've been encouraging people to do is when we've got an overcrowded situation in, in a community uh we i've been asking them to go and select a camp uh, somewhere else nearby but far enough away that that person is um not um, going to infect everybody else within the community. So that's a sick camp to go to and the nursing staff, whatever, can go over there. Um, they're not going to feel too isolated because they know they're still part of the group, but they can feel okay and they can recover there. We can take food there to, to those people. That's, that's if you can't, um, you know, if you can't self-isolate in home. Another option would be to actually, if possible, set aside a separate room where you can self-isolate and your and your family is um, able to care for you there. Thank you so much. Um, does anyone have, have anything else to add about the um, challenges if in multifamily households or? Um, overcrowded homes and our communities around self-isolation. So I just wanted to, um, this is Lana, I just wanted to speak to a bit of the guidelines that are coming out in some of the Treaty 7 communities around addressing this. We recognize that multiple people live together and if someone was to get sick in the house um, to test positive for corona or have COVID um, symptoms, we the recommendations are to do your best to kind of isolate them in one room, have um, provide hand washing, you know, hand sanitizer, clean the washroom after everyone uses it, cleaning door handles, kitchen um, counters, and just most common spaces. In some communities, they were setting up some shelter systems to for people to go, for those who are homeless or um, maybe living overcrowded situations. So it is a conversation that's being had, hard to address, I agree with you, because it's not just about telling people, well, you know, you're sick, you all just need to stay in one place because often it's it may be a mom or a dad or a grandma or an auntie or a grandpa. And, you know, how do you then, when we were sick in our home, there was no way I could have just stayed in my room. Like my son wouldn't have allowed it. We're family and we stay together. And I think just with hand washing, recognizing that yes, if one person gets sick, it will spread. Um, but I think there also needs to be a, 
a different response through government agencies and other um, health agencies to recognize that and could possibly um, brainstorm with each community on what would work. Thank you, um, everybody. Can I, just, yeah. can, can I just add that um, over here, what, what we're doing, like our, our particular tribe is, um, is in a city um, and we've got people from other communities uh, living in the city. So we, uh, with, in conjunction with the Larrakia Nation and the Northern Territory Government, we've organised to move those people, if they want to go back home to their communities, we are paying for their one-way uh, flight or bus or boat ticket out of here, um, so that they can so that they can get home uh, to where it's more isolated to reduce that uh, in the chance of getting getting that that illness. And um, and as they're homeless here in our town, um, you know that's going to um, help with their isolation. I don't, it's not exactly the answer, I guess, that you're looking for, but that's one way that we can reduce um, the incidence in that. And then from that, we're actually asking them, even, even though the communities are now closed, um, no one can go into or out of those communities uh, except for emergency services personnel. So they're closed. Uh, however, even from there, um, we've been asking people to go even more remote to their outstations where they can just live in smaller family groups um, for a couple of months, just take their medicines, live off the land, um, you know, take the um, things that they will need and just stay there until things settle. Thank you, everybody. Um, so, uh really good advice about um, how to deal with overcrowded situations in our nations and communities. I know in my, uh, the community that I work in, Kihiwan Cree Nation, that we are looking at um, possibly having people in a large space like the school gym um, who have symptoms. That way the whole family is protected and we just move the, the one individual and support them. Um, you know, bring them food, bring them all the things that they need, books, to wait out the two-week period, um, and so that everybody else is, is safe in the house as well. So all really good ideas from all of where you're from. Uh, there's been a question as, as it relates uh, specifically to children again, um, in terms of, uh, you know, some of the kids are, are getting a lot of anxiety um, around COVID, and, and they're washing their hands so much that um, they're becoming raw. So as parents, you know, how would you, how would you um, help your child deal with that in that situation? Because I know many parents are in similar situations. Dr. Liu or Dr. Potts. Sure. Um, so, so I think that, you know, one of the things, obviously with frequent hand washing, you can actually sort of set up a vicious cycle because if your hands are raw, we're more vulnerable to other kinds of infections, you know, cellulitis or even... So uh, a moisturizer is always a good idea. Um, in fact, you know, for people who do a lot of work in the hospitals, oftentimes there's a, a moisturizer next to the, the uh, hand sanitizer station. So I think that that's, I mean, short of not washing hands, which is what we don't want people to do, that um, using some kind of a moisturizer um, would be a good idea. Thank you. Um, Dr. Potts, Dr. Hill, anyone else want to jump in on that? Sure. So just to speak to kind of, I guess, the nature of the fear with children having around hand washing and fear, we did a little session with our kids about, you know, bugs and drugs and teaching them about viruses and bacteria and just recognizing, you know, with our kids, we told them that they're everywhere. It's not, this coronavirus is not a new, um, you know, new, brand new bug. Bugs are everywhere. We talked about little things and I think reassuring them that, there's good bugs and bad bugs, but the point for that was for our family was recognizing their fear, where that came from, what was their worst 
worry about having this? What did they, were they worried about us? Were they worried about themselves? And I found through um, expression of just letting them have their feelings. We started a sharing circle in our home every morning. We smudge and we have a sharing circle to talk about what we're excited about, what we're scared about. And we end the day kind of in the same way as well. And through that, I found it's open communication up even with my uh, son and my daughter around, around this. Uh, I got this idea off of just kind of ideas with dealing with emotions with children. And I think recognizing what they're hearing as brought up before is really scary. Um, and just having good conversations not having the news on, not just hearing all the bad things and be careful what we say around them, but also bringing them into the conversation and hearing their suggestions on how we could deal with this has been helpful. Thank you. Um, so just some more questions coming in from our online chat uh, with our Facebook Live users. A lot of people are asking about um, the need to wear rubber gloves and masks, um, how often you need to be uh, washing doorknobs and handles and light switches and things like that. Um, anyone want to comment on these for our listeners? Um, I'll take that. <laughs> um, so, so I think that that uh, um, that using the uh, household cleaning products like um, antiseptic spray or wipe is uh, on a frequent basis. I, I don't think there's any been. One recommendation, how frequently, but on at least twice a day w would be a good idea. Um, and I forgot the first part of that question. <laughs> yeah, so the first question was, um, a lot of people are worried that they need to wear gloves or masks continuously. Um, and so uh, can you just comment on the sure. gloves or masks? So, so actually, you know, one of the, the things that we're having is, is, a, is a true shortage of these kind of things, especially the masks. Um, so it's really to the gloves are not necessary because we just talked about the hand washing and really the people that need to wear a mask are people that have the symptoms because um they're the people that may be pass around pass on um, the the virus to other people whereas if everyone is trying to wear a mask we just simply wouldn't have a mask enough masks for everyone so certainly you know if someone had to go into a room uh, or close uh, a room where they knew a person was infected or, or uh, or we're strongly suspecting that the person was sick, uh, wearing a mask in that case. But generally, the better idea would be to have that person who's sick wear the mask when they're exposed to other people. And in fact, they can even keep their mask in, in a paper bag. So that way, the, the mask can be used more than once. Um, and, uh, and that's actually something that, that, you know, even in healthcare settings that we're starting to practice. Thanks everyone, and uh, thanks to everyone listening. We're uh, continuing to uh, monitor your questions and we'll put them in order. Uh, one thing that has come up um, in the questions and uh, prior to this session was about um, gathering. We gather, we're a community that gathers and you know there's uh, many people and uh, Kwika just talked to um, about having symptoms and if you're not having symptoms you know is it still okay to go to the gathering is it still okay to participate in ceremony because we we need to participate in the ceremony part of part of healing is ceremony uh, this question is specifically about what are we doing um, around gathering and what is what is the uh, your medical advice around uh, participating in gathering and uh, before answering that, I just want to say that there is so much innovation happening in communities that you've shared about, um, you know, how to uh, prepare and protect ourselves. But this is something that's really on people's minds about, you know, how do we, uh, what is the advice around gathering uh, for ceremony? I'll just let anybody take well, it. Um, I can just answer uh, recently, um, here at Six Nations, um, as most of you may know, we've had a blockade um, up um, as we're standing with the Wet'suwet'en hereditary chiefs. And we have, I've gone to the site, which is outside um, twice now, and um, not me personally, but with um, a couple of other elders that at different times did a tobacco burning outside. So essentially we all stood outside in a circle, we had a fire, we did the tobacco burning, we talked, and then we disbanded. Each time there was 
few of us. Like I think the first time there was about 13 or 14 of us. Um, and same with the second time. Um, but we're not hugging each other and touching each other. There's a bit of distancing and we're outside. So we, we're not exposed to, um, you know, like fomites where you might pick the virus up on your hands and then touch your face afterwards, which is one of the modes of transmission, right? Um, and again, I think we had talked before we got on the call um, that um, it depends on the risk, like stratifying the risk of your community and what's appropriate, what's not appropriate. There's going to be some ceremonies that just are not going to be a good idea. If you're in a closed space and there's a lot of people, um, it's, we have to look at all of those things because the root of transmission is you know, it's coming out in our breath and stuff and it's landing on things. And then people are touching those things and then touching their face and, and actually getting that into, um, into their system. And I'll just add that, you know, I, I read this very small powered study a while back about how our um, microbiome and our gut has been so altered because for years and years, people have been using antibacterial soaps. And so now what normally if you touched your, Face and it went into your GI system, you would, you know, your, your, your system would be able to fight. We kind of have lost a lot of that protection even as well. So many of us are compromised, immune compromised, and we don't even really know it, especially if those are the things that have been our practice so far, right? So that would be what I would say, like you have to, maybe each community has to look at, um, you know, what are the, what are appropriate? How many people can gather together? based on um, what's happening in your community. Because there's a difference between social distancing and isolating and quarantine, right? There's, there's, different, there's a difference between those things. Thank you, Dr. Hill. I know for myself, you know, it's Sundance singing time. Um, people are gathering to have Sundance singing in preparation for the Sundance in the summertime. Um, and, you know, a week ago, Anthony and myself had to have that conversation is, are we going to go to the Sundance singing? Um, and if possibly we have COVID-19 on our body, but we're asymptomatic, you know, do we want to risk spreading that around to our ceremonial community? So we made the hard decision of, you know what, we're just going to um, stay at home. Our minds are going to be with them. And um, we want to protect our elders and our ceremonial people by, um, you know, limiting gathering. And so that was a choice that we made as well. And I know many other people across the land are having to make similar choices. Um, our ceremonial people are strong. They will continue those ceremonies. And then when this dies down in the summertime, um, we'll be able to gather again like we once, once did, hopefully. So I look forward to those days. Um, I'd like to ask Dr. Bernice Downey, so um, as a medical anthropologist and former registered nurse and also former CEO of the National Aboriginal Health Organization, can you comment on the federal and provincial governments, um, you know, how, how has their response been as it relates to this crisis um, in relation to Indigenous people? And for health leaders within the community, what are some additional factors that community leaders need to consider when working to create effective plans for their nations? Yes, thanks, James. Um, so I've been I've been watching some of the questions coming forward, and and people are looking for very specific information. And I know one of the thoughts that I was having as our colleagues here were responding is that you know this is a new uh, viral situation, and you know there's information coming out every day. So. Um, you know, it is challenging, and um, but I respect people have lots of questions um, um, that they're looking for answers for. Um, so there are there are lots of things happening. Um, many of you are likely familiar with um, the government of Canada's position. They're, they've developed a, um, a response uh, for uh, First Nations and Inuit communities that in preparing for monitoring and responding. Uh, to communicable disease emergencies, including pandemic influenza and uh, other newly emerging ones like COVID-19. So they have developed a response plan, which is available on the internet. Um, and I had suggested that um, following the panel that we could post on the Facebook site some of these um, 
uh, websites where you can where you can go to and find most up to date and accurate information. Which, you know, we're we're like members of our communities, uh, just like everyone else, trying to get all the new information. And so these websites can be very helpful. But they do have a response plan for Indigenous communities, and they're working very closely with the regions. And uh, so the regional government information is also accessible. Um, they also have recently uh, released a YouTube video, um, which uh, is very helpful. They kind of break down the plan and, and talk about the most up-to-date information. Um, that can be posted on the website too, but if you Google YouTube Government of Canada, uh, you, you'll see that. Um, Indigenous-specific organizations, such as the National Collaborating Centre for Aboriginal Health, um, they also have an information site. Um, they're part of the Public Health Agency of Canada, and uh, they also have a link there um, to the National Collaborating Centre for Infectious Diseases with a, a very good podcast um, of, uh, that um, the Assembly of First Nations Health Director Marlene Larocque and uh, Dr. Merle Ballard from Manitoba um, are also sharing information on that on that podcast. So those are very uh, useful resources as well. Um, just in trying to prepare a little bit more for today, um, there is really limited literature on pandemics and Indigenous peoples and other specialty groups. Um, but that, that there is an acknowledgement, and I think this is important to remind ourselves, and I think what I'm hearing some of our colleagues say, um, you know, that we've been dealing with communicable diseases in our communities um, since the point of contact with European settler groups. And from the smallpox blankets that were distributed to the more contemporary uh, public health issues we continue to face, including tuberculosis and uh, HIV. So we do have a long history of trying to deal with communicable diseases. Uh, we now have access to public health interventions and education you know always remember knowledge is power so um, but be careful about the knowledge um, that you're receiving because it's coming from social networking and many sources so you have to go to um, very trusted sources for this for this information um, but we also have um, you know health access inequities and other problems such as what's been mentioned today, crowded housing, poor water quality, uh, that makes it challenging to implement hand washing. And so some of these resources, um, these um, unique challenges are emerging um, to folks who are doing this uh, regional uh, and community pandemic planning. Um, so I think that, you know, the, it's important to also remember that each community is unique and um, so some of the solutions that are being talked about may not fit for northern fly-in communities and so forth. Uh, so we are aware of that. Um, the other part that I wanted to say um, also was that um, also to consider who your partners are. So if you're someone out there that's, you know, involved, heavily involved in the planning, you know, this is a time of reconciliation and uh, reach out to your local partners. Um, universities have been drawing on community knowledge and expertise and our elders and our healthcare providers. It's time, you know, to act from a place of reciprocity and reach out to your local communities if you're working in universities or colleges and see how you can lend a hand. Um, that's a strategy that we're using at McMaster to reach out to our local communities. We're not sure what we can do. We're going to take our cue from them. Um, but there may be other uh, collaborations um, that you can that you can draw from um, so that you're not, um, you know, shouldering all the capacity burden on your own. Um, so anyway, the key message is uh, trusted sources of information. We can post some of those websites. Uh, remember, you all have resiliencies and uh, traditional people that can support you. There's been several questions on traditional uh, medicines and practitioners. So maybe I'll stop there and turn it um, back to Elisa to draw on that, uh, that area, that topic. Thank you. Thanks, actually I'll jump ahead to that question and we'll circle back to some of the questions that have been posted on the chat line and, and answer them as we'll be um, sitting together until 7.30. Um, so that gives us ha half an hour more together. 
Um, again, thanks for joining us and thanks to everybody who agreed to participate and take time out of your schedules uh, and the work that you're involved in. Um, so yes, uh, we'll post uh, some of those resources that uh, Bernice mentioned and there are resources that were uh, already put, people have put out to curated um, Indigenous resources and I uh, just posted a link to that in the chat line on Facebook Live. So this next question, I mean, um, we've been talking about it and, and you've responded in your answers. So um, is about Indigenous medicines, like, you know, people, that's probably one of the positive things that have come out of this. It's like looking back in our own cultures and strengths and saying, what can we do uh, based on this, this new virus that we're facing that has faced all of our communities? So um, Dr. Hill, you helped create one of uh, Canada's first integrative medical clinics um, that utilizes uh, uh, Mohawk medicines and Western medicines. Is there anything that you would like to share with uh, those listening about um, using their own traditional medicines from their own territories uh, during this uh, COVID-19 crisis? Uh, yeah, thank you very much uh, for asking. Um, so I guess just before I get to specifics, I would say that, you know, all of us, for um, all of our communities, traditional medicines were really about prevention, staying healthy. Um, it was a way of life. Um, we were always drinking the medicines. Um, and I, I think in a time like this, we're sort of reminded why it's important to pick that practice back up again, um, to be drinking the medicines on a regular basis. Um, we always did that through the winter. We were drinking, um, you know, cedar teas and white pine and uh, uh, squint death things uh, or um, wild ginger um, things to boost our immune system and even eating the foods that boost our immune system like onions and garlic um, in our foods, dark green leafy vegetables to help to build our blood system. We would be incorporating those foods um, during the winter months. Um, so those are things that we can still do now, um, you know, when we're not sick um, and even when we are sick. Um, and I think the important message to all of us as Indigenous people is to start doing that. Like start just, we don't have to wait for the next coronavirus. We can just start to do those things. Um, so it was really about staying healthy, staying well, even the ceremonies, um, you know, like sweat lodges, um, for us there was fasting, to just get rid of the stress. We know now that the high stress levels that are common in our communities, mostly because of racism and colonization and the stressors that we face on a regular basis, raise cortisone levels. And cortisone levels, when they're high, are counteractive to a strong immune system. Um, so doing things, you know, picking up those ceremonies that help us to unload that baggage and deal with the things that we've been through in the months before um, to help us stay clear of those things. And those are things that, you know, once this time of social distancing and um, isolation have passed, it's important to start mobilizing as communities and think about, you know, what are we doing? What have we sort of just left, you know, for, you know, a crisis time? Um, what, what do we need to pick back up again and start using on a regular basis? So prevention, also treating when we are sick, um, using those herbs, those medicines to do that. At Six Nations in 2005, uh, some of our traditional medicine people put together a little handout that had all of those herbs and foods um, and even supplies, things that you should have on hand um, and that was something that I dusted off again for this time. And I actually, um, talked to Alva, who is the lead traditional medicine practitioner I work with. I said, should we like send this out again to the community to bring that back into people's minds? Mm -hmm. And so she updated it and she did put it on her Facebook page. So she did post that on there, uh, for information. Um, but the third thing is also clearing our house clearing the air that we breathe. So we would often just have, uh, like potpourri, <laughs> um, the pot of water with cedar in it, bring it to a boil, and then let it simmer all day and just keep adding water to it. 
and we could do that for two or three days in a row and then give it a break and maybe do it again in a week or 10 days. It was a continual way of clearing the air. And we know now, if you look at the studies, it shows clearly that both smudging and um, doing that with, um, with cedar and white pine clears the air, it, it kills the germs in the air. So those are some of the traditional things that we could be doing. Um, and even just taking sort of this whole time of, of crisis, again, to pick up those other things like growing our own food. For, for Lodenoshone people, that, we're agriculturists, That's, that was our specialty. And yet I don't, we don't see gardens in everybody's yard anymore. Um, so that would be another important thing is to start looking at those things because we know now the consequence of pesticides on foods and what that does, you know, as endocrine mimickers in our body and increasing the rates of endocrine disease um, and um, increasing stress hormones in our body. Um, just all of the things that are related to industrialized food that our traditional knowledge and our traditional way ameliorate just naturally. Um, so really the message is just use this as a way to start to pick those things up. And everybody, there's people throughout all of our communities that have different pieces of the knowledge that when we start to pull it together, we get that full, that full picture again and start from where we are to move back um, in that direction. And I guess I think the, the last, thing that I would say is that now it's important for our communities to see this as um, a, an opportune time to pick up both our traditional knowledge and the Western knowledge that we've all gained and not disrespect one or the other. They're both so valuable and needed right now that we can mobilize that all to come together and work together to to achieve the best outcome not only now in the crisis but in the long run once this is long past us because there'll be another something down the road you know that's yeah thank you hey, thanks for that um thanks for that what i um wanted to say was basically there's a breakdown between well we need to combine so that we don't have a breakdown between spiritual, physical, and mental. Um, so uh, when we just look at spiritual, we can look at our traditional medicines, um, um, reconnecting, if we haven't, with our totems, with our ancestors, with our, for us, with our creator, our rainbow, our rainbow serpent. And what does this mean to us so that we can fortify ourselves spiritually, um, physical. Um, we need to look at in, um, coming back to our traditional foods. One of the things that I found as a doctor is that our bodies, Aboriginal bodies, um, um, are specifically designed to be eating our foods from our environment, not chemicals, not Western, and this is the difference between the dead food and the live food. Uh, so dead food is basically, you know, something that was never grown on trees or out of the ground or running around. And we need to um, use this in our bodies to give our bodies the maximum strength that, that we will need to fight this virus. Um, and uh, other things like, um, I agree, growing your own food, uh, personal hygiene, water, sleep, exercise, of course. And then there's the third part is the mental aspect of this, where we have to be calm um, and we have to listen to the guidance uh, and we can receive that guidance from our traditional leaders um, uh, to be calm. We can, uh, we can learn from our traditional and Western sources and I agree, we, can, we have to use the best of the traditional and the Western in, this, in, this, um, in making our bodies um, uh, as, as well prepared as we can. The other thing when it comes back to nutrition, um, and, and well, we, we call it bush medicine here, is to 
when, when those things come in season, like we also had this medicine that we would um, drink um, here now with this virus, we get a sore throat. We, you know, we need all the nutrient support that we got. So for example, um, we've got um, uh, trees that provide plums um, in the top part of Australia. That's extremely high in vitamin C. And so we need to remember that this is there and to, to utilise that, prepare it, collect it as soon as it's ready, start making the preparation. And then if we can use it and we can share it and we need to share that knowledge as well. Thank you so much, Dr. Fijo. Um, so we're gonna keep moving along the conversation and then we're gonna keep answering people's questions as well because there's so many that keep on coming in. Um, I just wanna to touch on the ceremonies as well because people had questions about should they continue to keep doing ceremonies? So definitely yes, please do ceremonies. The families that are gonna to continue to that, thank you so much. You know, for example, my Uncle Bernie is coming over to our house tomorrow to have a sweat. They've been self-isolating in their own house. So they're gonna go use the sweat um, Anthony and I are going to support from inside um, because if they have something, uh, you know, in their family, they're all going to have in a sweat too. Um, and, and then we're going to support from inside. So please continue to do, do those as a family. Um, I think the challenge comes from when uh, multiple different households come together um, and the social distancing is not able to be maintained, that that can be a challenge in terms of spreading the virus. Um, so, uh, Dr. Fijo, um, you've been very proactive in leading the Larrakia people in the Northern Territory in Australia. One of the ways um, is that you've been encouraging and supporting people to return back to the bush or country, as you guys say in Australia. In Canada, we would say returning to the land. Um, why are you doing this? But most importantly, how are your people's governments mobilizing to do this? And it's important for all of us to remember that our um, leaders of our nations are leaders of our own sovereign nation and have the ability to make our own decisions in terms of what's best for our own people and our own communities, which sometimes might differ from, uh, from the government regulations and in fact can be more stringent. So um, maybe you can share some of the good work that you're doing there. Okay, thank you. Um, so, it actually came out of a family meeting we had last Sunday, um, speaking with my brother, who is the chairperson of the Larrakia Nation. And I said, Richard, you know, we've got all of these people here. They need to go home to safety because where there's people, there is danger because this is how the disease And we, at that stage, we only had one person in the, north, the whole of the Northern Territory um, with that virus and that person was confined in hospital. So... Uh, so we got into action and uh, so Richard was able to link up, uh, so with this Aboriginal organisation, Larrakia Nation, link up with the Northern Territory Government, who, um, who um, together we, we were able to combine our funds and we say, right, um, anybody who comes from a community and if they're well, they can return to their community outside of Darwin and they can go to safety and we will just pay their one-way trip home. Now that gets rid of these people for us because it's our responsibility to look after everyone within our, our, our tribal lands, whether they're Aboriginal or not. So by clearing these people to those to home, that gets them safe and it reduces the amount of people here that we have to be concerned about. So we did that and, and it was actually picked up by the next town and they said, oh, wow, that's a great idea, so let's do that. Um, so it was um, it was putting this together. Now in that Monday, the poster was made. By Wednesday, we had nearly three hundred people return home. Um, this is in three days' work, uh, which is fantastic. But how do we how do we do that? Well, we've also got access to other funds through other investment organisations. And we're on the phone saying, now is the time, release that money. So if you've got organisations that have money um, or you, if you need money to be able to help look after your people, get on the phone and say, this is the time to loosen those purse strings now so that we can save as many people as possible by taking them away from danger. 
Thank you so much, Dr. Fijo. Um, incredible story of innovation and leadership that your people are demonstrating in terms of taking care of not only your own people, but visitors on your land as well. So thank you so much for sharing um, that with us here in North America. Um, so we have um, questions specifically from the audience about some prevention medications. Um, one is, uh, can hydroxychloroquine be used as a prevention medication or what is the role in treatment? Um, another one that's often asked is, I have heard about ibuprofen, should I not use it in fever if I do get the influenza-like illness symptoms? Um, so maybe we can answer that and then we'll get on to the next question. Um, anyone from the panel want to answer sure. that? Sure. Uh, so um, the, the problem I would say with most of these medications is that we don't really have a um, preventive medication and the medications which are being used are, are very, um, there, we don't have big data to, to say whether or not they're very effective. That being said, um, there certainly are some of these medicines, the antiviral medications, um, as well as um, the chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine, which are being used as certain, in certain treatment protocols in hospitals for people who are sick, and they're moderately to severe, severely sick. But generally, on the, um, if people are looking to use them in the community, it's probably, I mean, from my perspective, I wouldn't recommend it because there are certainly questions about dosage. There's questions about how effective they actually are. And any Western medication can have side effects. And, and the question is whether the side effects potentially from these medications might be worse than, than the symptoms. And there definitely is a recommendation, I believe the WHO recommendation, but uh, can correct me about um, NSAIDs and, and, and not to use those. Thank you so much. Um, I know Dr. Potts, you were mentioning something about um, coenzyme Q10. Is that something that you wanted to share with people um, as something that might might be helpful. Hi. So, in some of the data that um, you're just reviewing, as I live and breathe um, coronavirus, COVID virus, 24/7, with my jaw, there's different anecdotal stuff coming out, and a lot of stuff you hear data and you hear things on the internet. For those who are not um, within medicine and within science, you think, well, why? Why would they say this? Why would they put this out? And it's because they see things happening in different groups. Doesn't mean that it's going to work in every group. And there was some discussion on some um, information that was reading about COVID coenzyme Q10 around protection for heart protection. Um, it's a vitamin, there are, you know, my recommendation is to look into it, speak with your healthcare provider, especially if you're on other medications, because there are interactions again with it, um, just to look into that for protection. And that again comes across with all this data we see and little anecdotal, you know, snippets on the internet of not taking this and not taking that. And um, it's good just to review good sources um, and good to review um, this and recognize said many times over the last hour we learn something every day about this virus we learn things that we didn't know yesterday things that are happening across the world what we're looking at here in Canada is what was happening in China and Italy um, what they're doing in places like Singapore and South Korea on improvements on how social distancing works this is where why we recommend this so this could all change next week it could continue to grow but just to be alert, get good information, and continue to ha ask questions around it. Thanks for that, Lana. Does anybody else want to add about um, any sort of uh, medication or recommendations that you've seen come out and just want to uh, caution or support um, those recommendations? Um, there was a question about the vaccine. Yeah. And uh, unfortunately, the vaccine is, is just literally in the past few days, people have received the first um, dosages, but, but um, this is really going to take quite a while. And I don't think that, um, you know, realistically holding off, uh, holding out promise for the vaccine in, in, you know, a year, maybe a year and a half, but, but not usually sooner, just because, it, just again, it goes back to that safety issue that, that any, any um, vaccine needs to be tested. And I know there's quite a bit of, of controversy about vaccines in some communities, but from the Western perspective, any, any vaccine has to be uh, tested, first of all, if it's safe, and second of all, if it works. 
So that, that's quite a bit off. Thank you. Um, so time does fly. Um, I wanted to uh, give everybody an opportunity who joined us tonight as presenters um, to offer some closing remarks. Closing remarks around um, what your key messages are around uh, this, um, around the pandemic, and also offer some words of hope and encouragement to uh, listeners that are watching. I know for myself as um, a nutrition registered dietitian and now practicing medicine um, that um, there was a lot of questions around nutrition there. And this is not a uh, you know, one day uh, effort to try to solve this issue. We need to engage in long-term planning in our community. So those questions around planting gardens and you know, uh, supporting families to have access to nutritious and healthy foods, and also in leadership, supporting uh, families to access these foods. You know, we have to have innovation there, and we have to have um, compassion around how we're supporting families. So yes to all the questions about, you know, looking to your seed savers in your communities, looking to those knowledge keepers in those areas. We have med medical professionals who are on this panel tonight, but there are knowledge keepers in our communities uh, from all different walks, from our elders, from uh, those uh, you know, seed savers, as I would say, uh, that we have to engage in this discussion. So I'm going to invite each of our um, panelists tonight to uh, share some closing words, and I will start with uh, Dr. Downey. You there. Or I'll start with Lana and I'll give Danny, uh, Bernice some time. Hi, thank you. Thank you again for everyone for joining us and for those online. And um, I was reflecting on what, what are the things I wanted to share with you. And I think one of the teachings that I live by in my life is remembering everything I do in my life is for my elders and my children. And especially giving, um, you really honoring my grandmother, Rose Potts, who is who's lived through a lot. She lived and I asked her around this. I asked her, what shall we do? You know, she was, she was a nurse during um, the TB. She worked at the TB Sands and she lived in the North and seen the effects of the flu. She's from the Gwich'in Nation. And she said to me, you know, we just need to be aware. We need to take care and we need to recognize that this will pass, that we'll get through this and we're strong. And we need to continue to pray and look or self-reflect on, on what's important. And she really talked with me around just remaining hopeful is don't always look at bad, don't always look at the worst. And I'll give you a stat just for those about stats is right now in Canada, there's reported to be 1,296 people infected, active cases. This is data I'm looking at on another screen as I'm speaking to you. And out of those people, 1,295 are reported as mild, mild conditions, cough, probably cold, fever, doing well at home. Um, I want you to be hopeful through, hopeful through this, recognizing there are people out there that are fighting for you every day, that are recognizing and look into our medicine, look into ceremony, seek that out in a good way and recognize that, you know, we're home now. Start communication, start getting to know each other again, put our phones down, shut off the internet and just stay well. Thank you again for allowing me to be here. Thank you, Dr. Potts and uh, Bernice. Sorry, I just didn't hear you say Dr. Downey earlier. Um, yeah, I just, uh, you know, when I was, when I mentioned earlier about my own mom being in long-term care and not having access to family, um, you know, at first it was devastating because uh, it's challenging, challenging enough in contemporary times when we have to make choices of healthcare for family that, uh, you know, don't feel ideal to us, but you know, it's, uh, it's, it's how sometimes how we have to do things. Um, <clears throat> but um, so initially it was very challenging. And a couple of days later, I woke up in the morning, <clears throat> excuse me, and it was like I could hear my mom's voice in my ear. And, uh, and she's, uh, she's a very ethical person. Um, she's also very strong. Uh, she just turned 90 in December. She's very resilient. And, um, you know, it was what I could hear her saying to me was, we all have our part to do. You know, my, I'm here, I have to follow the regulations and the instructions here and take care of myself as best as I can. And uh, you kids, as she would call us, have to do your part and um, take care of yourselves and take care of each other. 
And that, uh, that gave me comfort, uh, rem remembering what her values are and her, um, her guidance and her teachings. And I think we all um, should, you know, reach out to our, to our elders and our family for, and listen carefully to what those uh, messages are. Um, and, and there was a lot of questions about making space for our elders and, um, and their teachings. And I have read somewhere, I've been reading so much information that um, the elders are, are making use of technology and talking about them uh, among themselves. And um, so I think we should create spaces uh, like this perhaps, or in other ways um, to bring their voices to the fore um and for each of us to talk to them and bring it back um they will they will encourage us to stay positive as well um and not to panic as was said earlier so thank you once again and um uh, i look forward to other opportunities to uh, share more information miigwech thanks for those uplifting words i'm going to ask uh lita to uh, share some closing messages and um hopeful words Alita, you have to put yourself off mute. Sorry about that. Okay, so um, looking at our strengths, I think as a people, uh, your people, my people, as, as a group of traditional people, we, you know what, we've got so many strengths to draw upon. And I think <clears throat> this is really important to remember because those strengths give us guidance and hope. Um, so one of the things I was thinking about was, you know, this, this far, where I live, this is crocodile country. We've got crocodiles everywhere. So, and, and, and they can be very, very dangerous. Uh, in, in, in my tribe, they're actually um, my totem. So, so some can guide us. Um, so, for example, just imagine that there is a billabong or, or a river. It's absolutely beautiful. Uh, you want to go close to that. We have to walk past that. But inside it is a great big crocodile that can get you. And uh, we, we, because we need to walk past that, that crocodile, we can't see it. But we know that it's there. So we can use... How do we get past that? We need to be guided past that in the safest way. And we have to be guided by a few different ways. We have to remember that we have strength in our community and family. Um, we have to be guided by our totems and by our ancestors, which is very important why we have to uh, keep on making those connections um, with our traditional beliefs. We have to be calm so that when we are calm, we can listen to the voice of the guiding ancestors. We can listen to the voice of, the, of our traditional healers um, and, our, and our doctors that are working for us so that they can help us to guide, to guide us through to safety. Um, and we have to remember that we have love for our family and for our community and we are trying to protect them. So, we have to remember that those people are also having love for us and our community, and they are trying to help us. Uh, and so, so we have this greatest strength by being our own community, Indigenous people, because that is full of love. And that is what we need to remember. Come, make sure we have strong connections, develop those connections and share the love and be one, be one as a, pe as a, pe as a person or as a, as a tribe or as a community. Um, and, our, and I 100% believe that we are going to be guided through this through our ancestors' advice. So be calm so that we can hear that guiding voice. Thank you very much. Um, and just while I'm thinking, I also want to uh, just thank in the background, I don't know more for helping us with the support on the, on the support side and uh, hosting the live chat and inviting um, all of these speakers. So uh, Kavika, would you like to uh, share some uh, closing key messages from your point of view?
you're on, you have to admit yourself. Mahalo. Um, so love and compassion for each other, um, you know, uh, and, and, and self-care, the things that we need to do to, that we do on a daily basis, whether that's ceremony, whether it's uh, eating well, staying hydrated, um, and just the, the, um, and, and, and being, uh, being active in some way and moving, you know, being in our bodies, being in, 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 pl in the place where we're at. I mean, I think that other people said this is a great opportunity to, to not just to not live in fear, but to draw ourselves together. You know, as we are, as we have to be um, shelter in place, we, we can be with each other, we can be with our families, we can be with our partners, we can be with our, not friends, <laughs> at least uh, probably not unless they're really close, but, um, but, but take that opportunity. And, you know, I want to provide um, uh, some hopeful data too from, um, uh, from here. Um, as of the 20, as of today, there were uh, 15,219 cases in the U.S. and total deaths are 201. So, um, uh, you know, although we, we regret everyone, um, any passing of, of someone, it's still, um, you know, relatively small numbers of people who, are, who have passed away. So we don't have, I apologize, I don't have morbidity, morbidity figures, um, but I would just say, you know, stay positive, enjoy the silences, um, and mahalo for the opportunity to, to be on this broadcast. Thank you. Um, and I'm going to call on Dr. Uh, Karen Hill um, to offer your uh, key messages as an Indigenous health practitioner to um, our listeners. Um, I guess I would just say, like, we've, we've been through this before. Um, and we came through. And we'll come through this as well. And to me, this is like that. It, it's like a little wake up call that it's really time for us to honor this earth that is our body. You know, each one of us, we're created from the earth and we're responsible for this earth that we inhabit that carries us through this life. And so now is the time to start picking up those things. And, and we, all the knowledge is there. We just have to start embodying it now and move forward and we will come through this and we have our families with us i live alone now so it's a little i got a cat though <laughs> so it's kind of nice to just have me and my cat here for a little while um but um this is not to panic um you know because i think we've we've had this we've had these things go through before we just haven't had this level of media input to continually keep us on edge and we can just sort of let that you know take what we need leave the rest um move forward accept the advice we're getting from you know the medical profession accept the things that we're picking up from our traditional knowledge keepers and um move forward yeah thank you for asking me to participate thank you um so I'm, I'm going to uh, let you know that we saw your questions and uh, we've run out of time. Uh, we encourage you to keep having these conversations with each other and uh, health professionals in your uh, region and where you're from. Um, I'm going to uh, pass it on to uh, James to uh, share his, his perspectives and uh, key messages. And I just want to thank you guys for allowing me to moderate this session. I learned so much and I'm uh, grateful for the knowledge shared. Uh, miigwech. So James, thank you. Thank you, Lisa, for helping to moderate um, and showing some leadership as one of our medical students. We're so supportive of you. Um, and also for all of the other panelists for taking time out of your schedule with your families and your lives and um, the I Don't Know More and Indigenous Climate Action, all the people who watched today, um, we saw all of your questions and it just shows us that we need to continue to have more conversation and dialogue amongst our people. Um, and this technology works really well for that. We're all in our homes. Um, we're all connected through technology. So I'd love to continue to do this again. Um, watch out for anything um, as this comes up again. We'll advertise it longer. Um, and this will be a link on the I Don't Know More main Facebook page as well as on YouTube. 
So just some closing messages for me, you know, one of the things that our elders here have always taught us is never to forget who we are, always remember our teachings, always remember our ancestors, and we're seeing all of that happen now. We're seeing people returning to wanting to know what medicines to use. Um, and the ones that we've been told in our area is we want to use the same medicines that got us through the previous epidemic. So smallpox and measles and tuberculosis. We have that in our um, blood memory. We have that in our teachings and our families. So let's use those and honor those as well as Western medicine. And that's our teachings as well. That we continue to be kind and love one another. I heard all of the physicians say that. And to respect people um, in our communities and not to ostracize them. I mean, Dr. Potts had to be isolated. Um, another one of the physicians who couldn't be here with us had to be isolated. And so this is going to be something that is going to happen. And we need to continue to work together and support one another. I think one of the beautiful gifts that this has given us is time to be still time to be at home with our families, time to reflect on um, spending that quality time, which we never get because we're so busy in our lives. And, um, you know, take this time to go snare rabbits, to go set nets, to go ice fish, to go start looking for those medicines as they start to wake up again. And that's the beauty of spring is that we are starting to wake up. And I think you know, looking at that from that perspective, that's one of the, um, the teachings that has come out of this for me anyway, in terms of coronavirus and COVID and how it's uniting us all together. We have, you know, people from all different nations on this call right now. And um, everyone is so open to sharing and together we're stronger and we were gonna, we we're gonna get through this like all the other panelists said. So thank you so much for um, spending time with us and we look forward to seeing you again. Have a good weekend, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everyone. <laughs>